So what are some of the most amazing things you've ever seen? What are, just, just in your mind, what's the most amazing thing that you've ever experienced? I, I, I wanted to show that because there's a lot within us that never gets out. These kids have somebody in their life or, or something motivated them, a catalyst that moved them forward to do something, become something that, that possibly they never thought they could do. It's funny, I was watching that, that video and I looked down in the thread and there was somebody that said, wow, I felt really good about myself for walking a mile until I watched this video. <laughs> this idea and this question about what is amazing, what's bigger than our minds can conceive of and our hearts can comprehend. We're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture as we're continuing to look at who Jesus is and trying to discover who He is. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture, and it is the one miracle that is captured by all four Gospels. It is the one miracle that all four Gospels felt like they needed to get into their story about who Jesus is. And so what I want to do is I want to jump in because we're going to walk through this kind of systematically and orderly. And so it begins in chapter 6. Now, there are two, there are two of these stories that we're going to kind of bring together. There's the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And there are a lot of similarities in these stories. And so we're going to walk through the feeding of the 5,000 and then bring in some issues and some things from the feeding of the 4,000. So let's jump in. It's found in Mark 6, beginning in verse 30. This is what the Word of God says through Mark. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, buy, something, buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit in groups on the, on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So we have this story that was captured by all four gospel writers. They felt like this was really important to capture this story. And something I want to say is this. If you have 5,000 people plus, because it says that there were 5,000 men, so there were probably about 8,000, they say 8,000, 9,000 people involved in this feeding. And so if you have eight to 9,000 people that were involved in this feeding, and you have this, this group of disciples that are going out and telling people, you'll never believe what Jesus did. We had 5,000 people. We had five loaves, two fish, and he fed them all. Now, if that was a lie, I can assure you that there would be a multitude of people in that area that are going, that's not true. But what if you were a part of that? What if you were one of the ones? What if you were one of the, the, the eight to 9,000 of that group and then the 4,000 people that were fed? So you're dealing with about 13,000 people. I want to show you a quick map because this gives us a little idea of the area that Jesus was operating in. When we hear about the ministry that Jesus had, sometimes we have this idea of the world. Jesus was not doing his ministry in the full world. Jesus was doing his ministry mostly on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. If you look up here in the top, Capernaum and Bethsaida and, and Chorazim and, and Caesarea Philippi, you look at these areas and that is where Jesus spent the majority of his time. When you read in scripture that he went to the other side, normally his headquarters was up here in Capernaum. So normally when it says he went to the other side, he's going over to Bethsaida. 
It's not a long trip. And so this idea that 13,000 people have been fed by such a, a small amount of things, it would have been easily debunked. It could have been easily said, that's not true. But the people that were there would have said, no, it was true. So they could have proven that wasn't true. I, I just say this to y'all, and I said, I, I said it last week, and I'll continue to say it. Y'all, the Word of God is not a myth. It's not made up stories. It is the reality of what God did through Jesus in the lives of the people around and so you had, you had about 13,000 between these two stories. You have about 13,000 people that were fed. But what you have at the beginning of this story is this. The disciples are coming back. And I just I want to ask you this question more as a rhetorical question. So how did you do this week of being the ones who are sent? How did you do this week of saying it's your turn? Did you, did you take that responsibility? Because the disciples in this story have come back from it being their turn. They've come back from preaching repentance. They've come back from healing the sick. They've come back from casting out demons. And if you involve yourself in the work of the kingdom of God, I just want to make something really clear. It will wear you out. It's not easy. It's not easy to be doing the work of the kingdom of God. And so they come back and they're going to Jesus. And I'm sure they're talking about everything that's going on. And Jesus says this to them. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to come with me to a desolate place. I want you to rest. You see, what Jesus wants is Jesus wants us to come away with him. He wants us to come away to a place of desolation to be with him. Now, why desolation? Because there are no distractions. There's nothing to grab our attention. There's nothing that we're going to be sitting there and we're going to be spending time with Jesus and all of a sudden we're going to have squirrel go on and we're going to go, what was that? Because normally what squirrel is to us is this now. I mean, squirrel is our digital media in front of us. And it's not just social media. It's everything. It's television. It's radio. We are doing everything we can to be entertained in this world. And what Jesus is saying is, I want you to get away with me. I want you to get away in desolation with me. Just as a side note, I've been reading articles about what social media is doing to us, and I hope you're reading these articles as well. It says it is leading to more isolation and more depression than ever before in the history of mankind. Social media. Social media. Why is it doing that? Because we're comparing our lives to other people. I've got one of our former staff members that's in Nice, France, and I'm watching his, his Instagram feed, and I'm going, man, that's, that's nice. Nice, get it? Side note. Okay, so that was a joke. Nice, nice. You missed it. Okay, so anyway, I'm watching, I'm watching him in Nice, France, and I'm like, he's having a great time. And we, we compare our lives to all these people, and we're going, oh, man, that is an incredible picture. You must be having a phenomenal time. I'm sitting here in my cubicle. But it isolates us because we don't have to talk anymore. We don't have to get face-to-face -face with anyone anymore. Do you all realize that there's so many people in our world that don't even know how to have conversations anymore? Because I can type it. So Jesus says, I want you to get away with me. I want you to get away to a desolate place that has no distractions. What Jesus is saying is this, and this is what we need to hear in regard to this part of the passage. Jesus is saying, I'm the one who can give you rest. Come be with me. Now, this isn't something new because God said it in the Old Testament. He said, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will what? Find me. Jesus says that if you seek the kingdom and its righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom. So when's the last time that you got away to a desolate, non-distracted place with Jesus just to be with Jesus? When's the last time? And I can hear it in your head. Oh, Scott, man, I just don't have time. I just don't have time. I just don't have time. If you don't make time, you will not find the rest. You will not find the rest why did God institute the Sabbath to give us rest? 
You look through all throughout Scripture, and there's this constant repetition of rest, 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 rest. I want to give you rest. I want to give you rest. And I talk to people all the time, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? Man, I am just worn, slap, out. When's the last time you rested? Just got with Jesus. Just got with Jesus. Now, that freaks some of you out. You're like, what would I do? What would I do in just a distracted, a non-distracted space just with Jesus? Hmm, I don't know. I'd love to find out. So Jesus called him aside. He said, I want you to get to a distracted place. The disciples, I'm sure they were like, yes. So they get in a boat. And some other people that were around them recognize them. And they're in their boat and they're going some way, somewhere to a desolate place. And what do these people do? They run. They run ahead of them. They go and they go across that place and they're going, where's Jesus going to land? Can't you just see these people running along the shore and the boat's going right here and the disciples are going, oh dear Lord, why are they, why are they following us? And these people are running. They're like, are they going to get here? No, no. Okay. So then they're going over here. Y'all, this is the desperation in the hearts of these people. They want to be with Jesus. There's something attractive about him. There's something attractive about his message. Have you lost that? Have you lost that desperation or running along the shore going, where's he going to land? Where's he going to land? Because I want to be there. Because that's where these people were. Why? Y'all, they were waiting for the kingdom of God. They'd been waiting for the kingdom of God. They were waiting for God to break through in their life. And this man named Jesus was speaking about the kingdom of God with authority and with certainty that they'd never heard before. And they wanted to hear it from him. And so they were going, is that something that's in you? Is it in you to just want to go find Jesus, to want to go find out where he is, to just want to go be with him, to want to go sit in his presence, to want to just stand with him? And y'all, here's the thing. So many of us have so many other things in our life, and it may be in our heart, but our actions prove what is true within us. But they're running, and the disciples are freaking out. Because they're like, man, I just need a little time. And so they land. And it says, when they land, Jesus sees them all and he has compassion. He has compassion for them. That word, that word compassion is panchmatsya or something like that. It's just, it's just, just this brutal kind of word. And what it means is in your gut. It means entrails. It means that his, his care for them, his pity for them was deep within himself. Not something that would pass like that, but something that he had such compassion for these people who came after him. Y'all, we're created in his image. Do you have that kind of compassion for the people that step into your life. Remember, the disciples were trying to get away. The disciples were trying to get to a place where they're, desolation, where, where they're desolate, where they could rest, and, where they, and all these people keep coming. And I know that you don't experience this, so let's just think hypothetically. You're going throughout your life, and you're going throughout your schedule, and things keep coming, and people keep coming, and people want something, and people want to grab something, and people want you, and people are calling you, and people are texting, and they're emailing, and they're, they're, they're Snapchatting, and they're doing all these things, and you got all these people coming to your life. Life. So is your first inclination to have compassion for them? Or is your first inclination to say, please leave me alone? Remember, these are people that these are people that just got back from doing ministry for the kingdom of God. It's not like they have a lot more in the reserve. So they think. Jesus had compassion on them. And so because he had compassion on them, this is what he did. He met their every want. He met their every need. He did exactly what they wanted him to do, right? No. That's what we want. We want God to meet us where we want God to meet us. We want God to show up where we want God to show up. We want God to do what we want God to do. But it, what, what does it say that Jesus first did? Can you go to that verse? It's the next verse. 
And he began to teach them many things. Seriously? We ran all this way. We're out of breath. I mean, you can look at us. You can see that we have need, Jesus, and you're going to teach us? You see, what Jesus does is because he has compassion, he meets them at their need, not at their wants. And with us, when Jesus looks on us with compassion, he meets us at our need, not at our want. And I promise you that, they, that these people were probably no different than you and I. And so when Jesus starts teaching, they're like, oh, my gosh, another sermon. Oh, golly, can he not just get over with it so I can be healed and move on? How long is he going to go? Doesn't he know that it's supposed to be within a one-hour time frame? I got to go eat something. I got to beat the crowd. I got to beat the rush. Doesn't he know that my favorite sports team plays in about an hour? (laughs) What is he doing? Then you go over in chapter 8 where they feed the 4,000. And Jesus looks at the crowd and he has compassion. He tells the disciples, he says, I've got compassion on these people because they've been with me for three days. What? Th- th- three days? You mean it wasn't just an hour? So, so you want me to go spend three days just listening to teaching about the kingdom of God? You want me to go spend three days just to listen to this man, Jesus? Man, I sure hope they have a good worship band. Because three days of just teaching, just rah, 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 rah. He surely has not, he hasn't heard that the attention span is only 10 minutes, and so his sermons need to be a lot quicker than that. He hasn't heard that, this Jesus guy. They're with him for three days. You know what he was teaching them? He's teaching about repentance about what it truly was to turn your mind and your heart and your being away from yourself, away from your world, to God. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God. If you go back and look at what Jesus teaches, he teaches about the kingdom of God. He's teaching about what this kingdom is going to look like. He was teaching them about who the Father is and who God really is because he was the very presence of God in their space. He was teaching them about who they are in relation to God. You see, we look at three days and we're like, that's crazy. I can't spend three days. We could spend a lifetime and not fully understand the kingdom of God. We could spend a lifetime and not understand who the Father is and who we are through the Father. Y'all, this is a lifetime of learning. This is a lifetime of sitting in the presence of Jesus saying, give me more, give me more, give me more. I need more of you. We sang that, didn't we? But we get worn out with an hour out of the week. I mean, some of y'all probably have already been sitting there going, when is this guy going to get done? The reason that they were willing to sit there for three days and listen to Jesus is because they were desperate for the kingdom of God. They were desperate for God to break through in their life. Now, the disciples... They were good guys. And it says, when it got late, they went to Jesus and they said, hey, it's late. We're in a desolate place. Isn't it time for us to send them off to go get something to eat? And I really think this was out of concern for the people. I think think the disciples were concerned for the people. But they're like, send them away so they can go get something to eat. And probably in the back of their mind, they're saying, and so that we can as well. And so Jesus looks at the disciples and says something crazy. You feed them. Jesus, I don't think you heard us. Because we said we should send them. Actually, we said you should send them away. And Jesus said, no, I want, I want you to feed them. And they said, you want us to go and to buy enough food for all these people, which would cost us 
200 days labor. That's what you want us to do. And this is what Jesus said. What do you have? What do you have? You see, here's the difference between Jesus and the disciples. The disciples were looking at what they saw in front of them. They saw a mass of people. And they knew they didn't have enough money nor food to take care of these people. But what Jesus knew is that God is able and sufficient to provide for all of our needs. And so Jesus says, what do you have? Go find out. And I want to say to you this morning that you may be at a place where you have true compassion for someone. You may be at a place where you have that, that entrail, that gut level compassion for something, someone. That compassion hasn't left. You want to meet their need, but you're sitting there going, but I really don't have anything. I don't have anything to give them. I don't have anything to offer them. I got like five bucks. I got like 10 minutes. I got you. And, and you limit it down to what you perceive in your life that you have. And Jesus is saying, just give me what you have. Show me what you have because I got something for you. And so they go out and they say, we got five loaves and two fish. That's it. Jesus is like, yeah, that'll work. So Jesus takes it, and this is really important. He takes it and he lifts it up and he blesses it. Because Jesus, the very Son of God, also knew that it was the blessing of the Father, it was the blessing of God that was going to be able to provide for this. Y'all, if you're trying to do it in your own strength, if you're trying to do it in the flesh, if you're trying to go, I'm good enough. I mean, I got, I got 15 minutes I can get, and you don't offer that time to God, I promise you it's going to fall short. It's going to fall short. If Jesus has to offer it to be blessed by God, how much more do we? If you got 10 minutes on your schedule that you can go and serve and care for someone, I just encourage you as you're walking, as you're going, offer that up to God and say, God, I want you to do some amazing things above and beyond my wildest imagination in this moment with these 10 minutes. I had students at times, they would come up to me and I'm like, well, who have you met recently and who have you gone and talked to Jesus about? And this is what they would say to me. You know, Scott, I'm a senior. I only got like, I, I got like two months. I mean, what good is two months? I mean, I'm just, I'm going to get to know them and then I'm really not don't having, and I'm like, do you realize what can happen in two months in the life of someone? I've seen someone come to Jesus in the nighttime and you're saying you only got two months? Do you know how many people could come into a relationship with Jesus in 10 minutes? What do you have? What do you have? Most every one of us in this room, we have a vehicle. Is there someone around us that doesn't, that needs, that needs us to come into their life and just provide a, a ride? Most every one of us in this room has discretionary money. We may not think we do because we don't spend it correctly for the purposes of God, but we, we got discretionary money. And it may be five bucks. Do you know what five bucks gets you when God blesses it? What do you have? Because that's what he asked the disciples. Y'all, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to have a vision of what God sees rather than a vision of what you see. Because what you see in front of you, I promise you, God will multiply and he will do it so extravagantly that people's needs will be met. So he blesses it and then it says this. It says he broke it and he gave it to the disciples to go and distribute among the people. That word broke is in the imperfect tense, which means this, for, for those of us who are not uh, grammar students. It means that he broke, and 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 he broke. And, he broke. 
What would you be if you were a disciple at that time? You're feeding 5,000 plus people. You're going and distributing what Jesus is giving you and it keeps breaking and you're going back and you're walking back. You know you and I would do this. You're walking back going, it's got to be empty by now. He's got to have nothing in his hands and all of a sudden he hands you something else. Do you know what kind of excitement and enthusiasm that's going to create in you? Do you realize what you're going to forget about in your own life? You're not going to, you're not going to remember you're hungry because you're doing the work of the kingdom of God. And you keep going back going, he's got more. He's got more. You need some more? And he goes back and goes, oh, he's got more. Where did the stupid fish come from? He's got more fish. And you keep going back and you keep going back and you're going to people and they're like, I'm hungry. And you're God. We got seconds. We got thirds. We got fourths. Whatever you want. And you keep going back. And you keep going back. And you keep going back. And it says that everyone ate. Everyone. And were satisfied it didn't just curb their hunger it wasn't just enough bread to go okay i can get by until until later tomorrow they were satisfied do we realize that that's what Jesus does? Do we realize that ha that's who Jesus is? That he is the one who comes and he provides abundantly and he provides in a way that satisfies the deepest hunger within our hearts. Do we realize that he is the bread of life? He said, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you will never be hungry again. And y'all, I've been listening over this past week where suicide rates from, 20, from 2006 to 2016 have increased 70 to 80% in our culture. 70 to 80 percent there are people that are hungry there are people that are desperate do we not understand that Jesus says that I'm the bread of life if you eat of me you will not go hungry and there are people that are hungering and thirsting and if we could just infuse Jesus into them but it means it means that we have to take it We gotta, we gotta stop being an impotent church. Because we have the only thing, we being the church, not just not us, but we have the only thing that satisfies. Jesus says, I'm the living water. If you drink of me, you'll never be thirsty again. You go back in Jeremiah 2, and God says that I am the fountain of living water. So Jesus is the living water coming from the fountain of living water that will never run dry. Is that who Jesus is to you? Because if not, go to a desolate place. Be with him. See how he meets your needs. See how he meets you there. See how in that desolate place where you don't have anything else and you're just depending on him, see that he will provide all that you need and more. And then you get to go and he keeps breaking it and you get to go and he keeps breaking it and you get to go and he keeps breaking it and you get to go. You see, he will never run out. Thirteen thousand people. They get to the end and they got twelve baskets full with the five thousand. They got seven baskets full with the with the four thousand. They got more than they need. Again, isn't that what that song said? More than enough. All of you is more than enough for all of me. But before we close, there's one caution for us. Actually, I want to read this passage before we go to that. It's found in Ephesians 3.20. It says this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask for or think, according, listen to this, according to the power at work within us. 
It's not this, this random thought of he can do anything above what we want him to do. Thank you, God, that you know it is within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the caution is this. So they fed 5,000 plus. They fed 4,000 plus. The disciples got to be a part of that. They got to go serve people. It's really fun to be able to serve when God's given and you're just like, yeah, man, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden Jesus says, hey, we need to go somewhere else. And in chapter 8, they get into another boat. They spend a lot of time in boats. And they get into another boat. And in verse 14, it says this. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. Think about that. Any irony? And then it says in verse 17, and Jesus aware that they were talking about bringing bread. Jesus is trying to teach them about the kingdom of God. He's trying to teach them about the Pharisees. He's trying to teach them about other people that are going to come in and try to undermine what they're doing, okay? Jesus is trying to keep their attention. They're in a boat. He's got a captive audience, right? And so verse 17, it says, and Jesus aware of this said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Have your eyes, having eyes that do not see, having ears that do not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven of the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. (laughs) And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Man, y'all, don't don't forget. Go back in your life. Go, God, where have you shown up? Reveal to me where you've shown up. I'm going to write that down. And I'm going to remember that basket was full. Where else did you show up? I'm going to write down because I'm going to remember that basket's full. Because you're going to get in a boat. And you're going to go, I forgot bread. I forgot bread. And Jesus is going, what is wrong with you? You've forgotten the 12 basketfuls. You've forgotten how amazing the Father showed up. You forgot how I provided and how it not only provided, but it satisfied and was abundant. You forgot that. Y'all, we've got to be the ones who remember that so we can go tell other people about it. And the people said, yeah, okay. I don't know where you are in this story. You're somewhere in the store. And if you're desperate for Jesus, I just pray that you will run along the shore, finding out where he is and be with him. If you're following him and if you're a disciple of his and you need to stop and you need to go to a desolate place and spend time with him, find the space to do that. If you're at a place where God is just working through you right now and you're, and you're just handing out what he's, what he's given you, just praise God for that moment. Praise God for the fact that he is providing for you in such a way that you can offer it and give it to other people. But please, don't forget how good God is. Don't forget how he provides. Don't forget the immeasurable ways that he meets the needs of you and I and the people around us. And he says to you and he says to me, you go feed them. Do you trust me? You go feed them. Do you believe in me? You go feed them. Do you think I can? You go feed them. Marcy and I, at the end of our engage group, um, we start engage group at 6.30, and the last person left about 9.30. And almost every engage group that we lead, we turn to one another and we're like, we're tired. But the thing about it is, at the end of every engage group, we look at each other and we go, we are full. I don't want you to hear that every engaged group we have is incredible and amazing and God shows up and, and the glory of God shows up to where we can't even stand. No, I, no, sometimes it's just like, yeah, we're together. But we're full because we're being faithful to who God's called us to be as a people. 
when you're doing the work of the kingdom of God, you're going to get tired. He can satisfy you. He can refresh you. He can give you rest. But the one thing I want to encourage you in is this. Don't work your tail off trying to keep a reserve for yourself. There's so many of us that are like, man, I would love to do that, but I just don't, I can't, I'm tired, I'm weary. You see, God has created you, not for you. God has created you to go give them the food. The weariness that you may feel right now may not be because you're serving God. It may be because you're tired and weary because you're serving yourself. And if you begin to serve God, you may get more energy. You may get more fuel than you ever thought you would ever get because you're doing the very thing that God has created you to do. Test it. Challenge it. Let's pray. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the bread of life. Thank you that you tell us in your word and he tells us that if we eat of him, we will never be hungry. If we drink of him, we will never be thirsty. And God, let us come to this table with that certainty. Thank you that you've called us to so much more. God, change us in this moment, in this moment right now. And I pray for anyone who's not following you, anyone who's in that place of questioning, anyone who's in that place of going, I can't put these things together. I just pray that they would trust in you, that they would say, I'm going to trust you, God. Even though I don't fully understand it, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to trust that you will meet me, and you will provide for me, and you will show me. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.